but we checked in that one night and um i remember the one sensor operator that we had uh marty van buren uh, a great guy through their sensors they were able to see tracer fire from the two armor uh our armor guys on the ground so they did a uh they just followed the tracers to a certain point and we just stared at that area for I don't know, like, it seems like forever. Yeah. But it, it, it probably only like three or four minutes. All right. And finally they said, yeah, we got somebody in, they're in defilade. So it was like these, it was like a, uh, I don't know, just some kind of tree farm or whatever. So they had like these canals of water. Yep. They were going in like a parallel formation or, or whatever. And these guys were down in there. There's three guys. And they're like, we got them. And then we called down and, uh, the the navigator on the aircraft is the one that's in charge of all the communications with the aircraft to the ground. Mm. Um, communications from the aircraft back to home station and everybody else that's not in the air. Gotcha. Um, and then we we found them and we got permissions immediately. So we fired twelve rounds on those dudes, three guys, and it was that moment really set set in because it was like the very first time that I'm seeing it right there. Yeah. They, all the crew was in there cheering because they got what they call a torso toss. I mean, literally a 105 Close. round hit that guy right in the center, right, I guess, in the pelvic area. Oh. And you could, see, you could see as the explosion went up, just the top half of them just kind of uplifting into the air and flying down. And I'm just like looking at this on the screen right there in front of me with this kind of like NVGs, but it's a, they call it 12 color grayscale yeah. screen or green screen or whatever. So, I'm looking at it like almost horrified, but everybody else is like, yeah, yeah, get some. Right. You hear the gunner, you hear the gunners in the background yelling gun ready. And it's like, oh shit, this is, this is happening. This, this has happened. I'm watching it unfold. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was a lot to take in, sure. um, you know, from that experience, it was like, wow, this is, this is profound. And then from that moment on things started picking up. It was because it was like two months of no shooting, no nothing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, we're in it and they have other units that are calling in. Um, but that was a, that was a crazy deployment um, for me anyway. Cause it was like, Oh shit, this is what we're doing. Okay. Right. We're doing this. <laughs> we're killing people. Yeah. But it was, you know, it was. And it had know, to be like, like night and day from what you're used to. Like, you know, you had the army background, you're a combo dude, you're on the ground and now you're like in the air. Just, it, it couldn't, it had to be surreal. It, it was very surreal because yeah. it was like instantly, we could see what we were doing, what impacts we had. Right. You know, because the ground guys are calling for everything. You know, you have your five line call for fire. They're calling for all this stuff and we're immediately delivering it. Yeah. And so we're seeing it and then we're, hey, yeah, rounds are good, you know, or, you know, we're, we're tweaking right now or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, when we call the JTAC on the ground or whoever's, or the FSO or the FO if in in some cases. Sure. And we're just calling them and say, hey, yeah, you know, this, this is, your BDA, this is where rounds complete. You know, when we met your intent, what's the next tasking? Yeah. In a so. permissive environment, there's nothing better than a gunship. I mean, I, I love helicopters, love A-10s, love all that stuff. But if, if you're, if, like I said, if it's permissive and they're having a gunship just circle overhead, just, I mean, the sensors, just the capabilities of the platform is phenomenal. You know, just amazing. Yeah. And and everything an you want. Anything you want. Yeah. Yeah. And it just delivers everything, you know. Yeah. And... And follow on deployments, um, I, have, I actually did one deployment where they did a floor load of ammunition. So this was back when or the U-model gunship, for anybody that wants to Google it, we had three guns. We had gun one, gun two, gun three. Gun one was the GAL-12 equalizer, the 25 millimeter Gatling gun. Gun two was the 40 mic mic Bofors cannon, which was actually, yeah, it was derived from pre-World War II. Uh, anti-aircraft artillery, but the guns that we actually used on the aircraft were from army, um, was it M42 dusters uh, some kind of tracked vehicle that had two guns, two 40 millimeter guns on it. Oh, no kidding. I didn't know that. And it was only one gun because the guns were mirrored. You had a left gun and a right gun and they were actually mirror, uh, mirror images of each other. Okay. So it was just one of the guns. I don't remember which one. And they had the one Oh five, which was a M one Oh two army field, howitzer um right. but the rounds were specialized for all three guns so we would floor load ammunition and that was for the 40 millimeter 
So we carried 256 rounds of 40 mic mic, but you, we could floor load additional cans of about 100 rounds in these big steel cans. And one mission, and I think it was when we were supporting the Fallujah or Fallujah 2 mm-hmm. for the Marines, it was it was not unheard of for gunships to Winchester really on that shit. And it was just like, holy shit, you have 100 rounds of 105, 256 rounds of 40 mic mic, and 3,000 rounds of 25 mic mic, and you're coming back empty. Yeah. And it's just unleashing, you know, every bit of hate that you could possibly think on the enemy down below. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was devastating for the, for the enemy, I'm sure. Oh yeah. It had to been. And I know that, uh, there were discussions at some point while I was at the fourth SOS, um, that somebody wanted to pull the 25 millimeter gun off of the aircraft. And it was the three us SOCOM, the army came back and said, no, yeah, you're not going to do that. You're, you're going to keep what you have because, and then they had this report of some insurgent that they had in an interrogation one night and they're trying to get information out of him. And he's like, Nope, I'm not talking. Nope. I'm not talking. And somewhere in the distance of a new model gunship checked in and they started firing off the 25, <laughs> the 25 might, might gun. Yeah. And when you heard that thing going off that, that apparently from the report, this guy just melted in his seat and said, I'll tell you anything. I'll tell you anything. Just get that thing away. It just get it away. It's going to kill me. You know, yeah. it's like that right there had a profound uh, psychological impact on the enemy. Yeah. And um, it would come in play later on with one of the uh, missions that we supported. Um, I'm trying to remember the TAC P, uh, Scott Losher. Okay. I don't know if you remember him or yeah, not. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he was. Um, he was with Cav down in Karbala, and it was May of 2005. We had checked in, and this is when uh, Makdada al Sadr's Mookie Boys were doing their thing. You had the Sadr militia, right? So they had holed up, and then it was like a whole other, you know, you have insurgents, but then you have this army of insurgents. So it's kind of like confusing because now they're like different factions within if it's either Shia or Sunni Islam, you know, battling each other, but they're also battling the great imperialist enemy us sure. or whatever else. So it's just, it's confusing as shit to keep up with all this stuff. So one night we check in and we call it the dog bone mosque because most of the country is without power or eh, power was skosh, mm-hmm. but the mosques usually had a lot, their own power generation or well, the Imam Ali mosque or the Imam Ali shrine in Karbala was one of those protected sites. And there was two mosques that are right next to each other with this courtyard in between from the air, from a distance at night, it looked like a dog boom. Okay. So we just called it the dog boom. You know, it was like a reference point, you know, it's, you know, like as you're driving to, uh, TGI Fridays and you're like, Hey, we're passing the water tower you know, <laughs> right. as a, as a visual res- visual reference point. There it is. So here's the dog bone mosque, but we're checking in overhead. So the cav, they're having a lot of problems with these guys because they're armed to the teeth mm-hmm. and we're overhead. We can see that they're, the insurgents are violating. They're violating the protection because there's heavy, heavy crew served weapons and et cetera on the rooftop of these mosques. So yeah. now that mosque technically is no longer protected right. because they're using it inappropriately, but because of its significance, cultural significance, it was like, Oh, hands off. So we're talking to the JTAC, and later on, it was subsequently, I found out it was Scott Losher. And he handed the, the, the mic to the commander. And the commander was like, very verbose. But he said in plain, plain freaking English, look, you do not understand how important it is that we have zero, zero effects on this mosque. Because it will crush every effort that we had. That building that's 25 meters away. You guys, the three-story structure, you guys are, make it go away. We're like, okay. It's like type three control. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 64 rounds of 105 delay into that bitch. 64 rounds of delay. And then the guys that were squirting out of the building were tracking them down with a 40 in in the alleyways. And the 40 is, oh my God, it's, it's, it's amazing because when it hits and it frags out, you have frag bouncing off the walls, et cetera. And it just turns into a shit show for anybody that wants to live. You know, you're not going to make it because of my position. I really didn't have much, you know, 
defending of the aircraft, as I said earlier. But what I was doing was I was trying to help the crew keep up with what we were seeing as far as the uh, EKIA counts. Sure. So when we landed, so I had counted like, I don't know, like 30 some odd dudes that we'd tracked down and ended, you know, with that entire control for that night. And I mean, we did a lot of shooting. Uh, but we landed and then the Intel guys ran out to the plane when we landed and they say, Hey, you know, the significance of what just happened, you guys need to come up here. So apparently, cause we landed in the morning, apparently the next day, Muqtada or Sadr and his entire militia laid down their arms and walked away. They said, yep, we're done. Really? We are, we're done. We're, <laughs> we're, I mean, you can look it up and they said, yep, we're done. We're out. We had enough of this. Nice. So profound effects, you know, from, you know, what I'm seeing from the, you know, from the, from the air, and versus what I had in my career on the ground, it was like, you know, this is night and day. This is, I mean, we're having profound impacts. 